After the deaths of Robert Herron, Olive Thomas, and especially Virginia Rappé and the controversy surrounding Fatty Arbuckle, there was yet another mysterious death involving a famous movie person, the third year in a row of such a publicized death involving the movie industry. This time, the victim was William Desmond Taylor, a famous director and actor. On the night of February 1st, 1922, Taylor spent time in his Hollywood home casually chatting with actress Mabel Normand starting around 7pm. At around 7.45, Normand got into her car and her driver drove her away. She said they had arranged to talk by telephone later that night, but Taylor's call never came. An estimated 15 minutes after Normand left, Taylor was shot inside his home. Taylor's neighbor, actor Douglas McLean, and his wife reported hearing a loud sound like a car backfiring around 8pm, which would have been very close to the time that Mabel Norman said she left the house. They also said they saw a strange man about that same time. Taylor was shot in the left side of his back, about elbow length high, and the gun had been fired at a strangely upward trajectory at close range, and the bullet ended up in the base of his neck. At the time of his murder, it looked like Taylor had been working on his checkbook at his desk. It was considered a strong possibility that the killer may very well have been hiding an ambush inside the house. Taylor's body wasn't discovered until the next morning by his valet, Henry Peavy, where it was lying next to his desk. Peavy reportedly shouted, Murder! Murder! And the police were called. There was little physical evidence found in direct relation to the murder, but quite a bit that might possibly have been related, though nothing important seemed to have been taken from the house, which meant that the motive had likely not been robbery. Backing up this conclusion was the fact that $78, a two-carat diamond ring, and a platinum watch were found in Taylor's pockets. The murder quickly became a huge headline in the newspapers. Just like in the Fatty Arbuckle scandal, gossip columns, as well as more legitimate newspapers, immediately began publishing long articles covering the story. Then, more details of Taylor's personal life made their way into the news. It was speculated that Taylor had had a relationship with the young actress Mary Miles Minter, and love letters she sent him were made public. But many who knew her or Taylor asserted that Minter's love was not reciprocated. Minter was considered as a suspect, and there is some evidence to support this. Of course, there's the motive of the jilted lover. And also, three blonde hairs were found on Taylor's clothes. These were compared with known samples of Minter's hair by an expert, who confirmed they were the same. However, forensic science at that time was far from precise, so there's a strong possibility of a mistake. And it doesn't necessarily prove anything even if the hairs were Minter's. It just indicates that maybe she had hugged him or was near him a relatively short time before he was killed. Another suspect was actress Mabel Normand, who, as we know, was the last known person to see Taylor alive, being in his home very shortly before he was believed to have been killed. It also seems that she too had unreciprocated love for Taylor. Love letters written in code by Normand were found in Taylor's home after they had briefly gone missing. Normand said she would gladly allow them to be published if it cleared her of suspicion. While the letters from 29-year-old Normand were embarrassingly similar to a schoolgirl declaring her love, they provided nothing of real interest for the investigation. One sensational explanation for the murder was considered based on testimony from an assistant United States attorney. He said that Taylor had intervened on behalf of an unnamed drug-addicted actress against her dealers, some believing that this was Normand. If true, this could mean that the dealers had Taylor killed before he exposed their lucrative operation. And Taylor's case became even more bizarre after it was discovered that he had led a completely different life previously. In 1908, he had abruptly left his wife of nearly seven years, his young daughter, and his job as an antiques dealer. Then, he had been William Dean Tanner, which was his birth name. After four years of his absence, his wife got a legal divorce from him, and presumed him to be dead. Some years later, he had become a movie actor, and his now ex-wife saw him on the screen and recognized him. 
they eventually got into contact again, and it appeared that Taylor couldn't remember his previous life. The exact reason isn't clear, and his memory loss can't really be completely confirmed now, but he had suffered from severe memory lapses before, and could easily have had a massive episode of amnesia or something similar. Conditions like that certainly do exist. To make things even stranger, his brother, Dennis Dean Tanner, had also left his wife without warning and disappeared under similar circumstances. There had been some speculation that Dennis was somehow involved in Taylor's murder, but nothing substantial has been uncovered, and it's very unlikely despite the uncanny similarities in their cases. There was a more promising suspect, a man named Edward F. Sands, who had been Taylor's assistant. The year before his death, Taylor came back from a vacation to find that Sands had stolen some valuable things from him, including jewelry and his car. Then Sands disappeared. He briefly resurfaced to steal more jewelry from Taylor's house, and then disappeared again. To this day, we have no idea what happened to him after that. This mysterious man initially proved to be a likely suspect. There was quite a bit of circumstantial evidence against him, as well as a possible motive. After stealing from Taylor, Sands sent him a message that made it clear that he knew his true identity. The reason why this might be important is that police thought blackmail might have been a motive, and perhaps Sands would have exposed Taylor's secret unless he paid him off. And he had also allegedly threatened to kill Taylor the day before he died. But there were some problems with Sands as a suspect. Sands had seemed keen on stealing from Taylor multiple times before, so why didn't he steal anything after the murder? Another important thing was that Faith McLean, the neighbor, was sure that he wasn't the man she had seen, and she had previously been familiar with him. Another piece of evidence is an alleged spotting of a man looking like Sands far away in Oakland around the time of the murder. But any of those things could simply be mistakes. However, despite witness statements about the person at the scene being described as a man, it was still considered that the killer might have been a jealous or heartbroken woman, perhaps from the movie industry, which was partly why Mary Miles Minter and Mabel Normand had been initial suspects. One theory was that a woman may have been disguised as a man, or at least dressed in a way that made witnesses mistake her for a man. Backing up this claim was Faith McLean's statement that the man she saw outside of Taylor's door at night was funny looking, specifically drawing comparisons to an actress who was dressed up like a man during filming for a movie. There were some other pretty out there theories. One of them was that Dennis Dean Tanner was actually masquerading around as Edward Sands and killed his brother. Even though this was quickly disproven, it demonstrates how this case captured people's imaginations. Other suspects in the murder included Mary Miles Minter's mother, Charlotte Shelby, who may have wanted to protect her daughter or may have been in love with Taylor herself. And then there was Henry Peavy, Taylor's valet, and the man who first discovered Taylor's body, as well as actress Margaret Gibson. Allegedly, Gibson even made a deathbed confession to the murder in 1964, but the authenticity of this story is questionable. And it's important to note that this was but one of around 300 reported confessions to Taylor's murder. This scandal had many similarities with the Fatty Arbuckle scandal, with a mix of truth and gossip, movie people, a sordid affair, murder, and tarnished careers. Both Mary Miles Minter's and Mabel Norman's careers in Hollywood were irreparably damaged by the scandal, despite the fact that they were, and still are, considered unlikely to have been the killer. The case remains unsolved to this day. Like many unsolved murders, there are many people who are practically obsessed with solving the mystery behind Taylor's death, and it's no wonder. Virtually every existing document or testimony has been documented, but it seems unlikely that anything will be definitively proven at this point. There are so many twists and turns to this story that it definitely deserves its own lengthy video. President Warren G. Harding had one of the most infamous administrations in American history. 
Many have probably heard his name before, but maybe don't know much about him except for the Teapot Dome scandal. But while he was president, he was fairly popular. Much of that notoriety came later, after his death. In hindsight, he has been consistently ranked throughout the past five decades in the lowest quartile of US presidents based on their overall performance. This places him alongside forgettable names such as Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan. In the summer of 1923, President Harding was making a tour of the west coast of the US as well as Canada and the US Territory of Alaska on what was dubbed the Voyage of Understanding. This made him the first sitting US president to visit Canada and Alaska. The tour kicked off in the wake of revelations of corruption among people he had appointed to office, which was bound to cause problems soon. First, Harding arrived in Seattle in July and spent time admiring the natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest. While in Alaska, he made a long speech in the surprisingly sweltering heat reaching well into the 90s. Throughout the first weeks of his visit, he seemed to be in a good mood, though while traveling, the stress of recent events had made him frustrated. He had become aware of the corruption that would eventually explode into the Teapot Dome scandal, as well as another scandal involving the Veterans Bureau. He asked his Secretary of Commerce and future President, Herbert Hoover, about the corruption in his administration. Hoover later wrote that he told him if he were in Harding's place, he thought it would be best to expose the corruption publicly. Then the President's honor could be saved. But there would never be a chance for Harding to do that, even if he had wanted to. Coupled with this stress, Harding was also in poor health. In particular, he was found to have an enlarged heart. Additionally, he might also have been sick with food poisoning after eating seafood. His last speeches of the trip were poorly given, and he looked weak and frail, according to later reports. His condition reached such a point that he was taken to San Francisco, and a few planned stops in California were cancelled. He was taken to the Palace Hotel to rest and receive medical treatment. Despite abdominal pain, Harding seemed to be making a recovery before he took a sharp turn for the worse. Around 7 p.m. on August 2nd, 1923, his wife Florence was reading a magazine article to him as he was in bed in the Palace Hotel. It was a positive article about him in the Saturday Evening Post. Florence stopped reading for a moment, and Harding said, That's good. Go on, read some more. Almost immediately after that, he slumped back in intense pain and lost consciousness. Attempts were made to revive him by his doctors, but with no success, and he was pronounced dead shortly afterward. At the time, Harding's cause of death was listed as a stroke, though it's now generally accepted that it was a heart attack. Florence refused to have an autopsy performed, likely because it had been obvious that Harding had been in ill health and she didn't want his body to be probed. But of course, this decision has been scrutinized by certain people as being part of some kind of conspiracy. And there's no real evidence to support the later claim that she poisoned him, and it never gained any traction. After Harding's death, some of the doctors who had attended to him were publicly attacked. Dr. Ray Lyman Wilbur, one of the doctors present at Harding's bedside, later wrote, We, the doctors, were accused of starving the president to death of feeding him to death, of assisting and slowly poisoning him, and of plying him to death with pills and purgatives. We were accused of being abysmally ignorant, stupid and incompetent, and even of malpractice." At the time of his death, Harding was still relatively popular with the public, and the nation mourned the loss of their president as the investigations into the scandals of members of his administration continued. As previously mentioned, Harding had learned about some of the corruption before he died, and was appalled, and certainly didn't approve or encourage it. And in his last days, he had been struggling with the question of what to do about it, and he felt betrayed by the friends he had appointed to government positions. No matter how much or how little blame you give to Harding personally, the fact remains that his presidency was forever tarnished and Harding never even had a chance to defend himself publicly. 
the government's precarious relationship with Harding and all the baggage of his administration was clearly demonstrated by the very slow recognition of the Harding Memorial in his hometown of Marion, Ohio. It was completed in 1927, and the bodies of Warren and Florence Harding were interred, but the official dedication did not happen until 1931. Harding's successor, Calvin Coolidge, was in a rather awkward political situation and didn't bother to do it. So the task was left to Coolidge's successor, Herbert Hoover. Hoover had known Harding more closely than Coolidge, and was one of the few in the Republican Party who was willing to publicly speak positively about Harding after his death. Although many have understandably questioned Harding's judgment and who he appointed to government positions, it should be noted that he had also made some good appointments as well, and it wasn't his entire cabinet that was involved in the scandals. There have been efforts to restore some of Harding's reputation, at least as an individual, but I'm not so sure that they've been very successful overall. And whether he deserves it or not is up to you. The next person is Martha Mansfield. She's a lesser-known celebrity, but the story of her death is truly tragic, though it didn't get nearly as much attention in the media as you might expect. Martha Mansfield was born Martha Ehrlich, but she was unsatisfied with her last name for her career, so she changed it to Mansfield, which was the name of the Ohio town where her mother had lived after immigrating from Ireland. She dabbled in many kinds of jobs in the art and entertainment world, first going on Broadway, then becoming an artist model, before starting her film career on the East Coast. Her first films in 1917 were alongside another ill-fated actor, Max Linder. The next year, she joined the Ziegfeld Follies, then shortly afterward decided to move to Hollywood to further pursue a movie career there. Her first Hollywood movie was released in 1920, and her first real breakthrough movie was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that same year, where she appeared alongside the illustrious actor John Barrymore. She also found some success with the 1923 movie The Silent Command, which featured Bela Lugosi. Also in 1923, she received the lead female role in The Warrens of Virginia, a Civil War-era romance drama and filming commenced at Brackenridge Park in San Antonio, Texas. For her role, Mansfield had to wear a large Civil War-era frilly hoop skirt dress, a crinoline to be exact. After finishing her parts for the day, Mansfield went to her car. The following events are a bit foggy, but somehow a used match landed near Mansfield's dress, setting it on fire. Newspapers reported that someone else involved in the filming had lit a cigarette with the match, then tossed it, and it happened to land right on Mansfield. The flames spread quickly. Those nearby rushed to help her. Co-star Wilfred Lytell threw his jacket over her in an attempt to snuff out the fire, sparing her further burns to her face and neck. And the driver of Mansfield's car suffered severe burns to his right hand while trying to help her. The flames were eventually put out, but not before Mansfield had suffered horrific burns. She was still alive, however, and was rushed to a hospital to be treated. Some newspapers published optimistic blurbs about her recovery, as well as the director's comment that filming for the Warrens of Virginia was set to continue after her recovery. One report said that she would be able to recover in a week, or possibly 10 days. But her injuries proved to be too serious, and she died at 11.50 a.m. on November 30th, 1923. She was only 24 years old. She had barely even begun her Hollywood career by the time of her death, and would likely have become more popular if she had been able to continue. Among the pallbearers at her funeral were David Selznick and Samuel Goldwyn. No one knows exactly where the match came from, and there were never any reports or indications that anyone was sought in connection for the negligence. So it's very possible that someone had to live for decades with that on their conscience, but we'll never know who they were. There's also a different narrative that perhaps Mansfield herself had discarded the fatal match. 
To make the tragedy even worse, her last film, The Warrens of Virginia, is now a lost film. Filming had been completed without Mansfield, and was eventually released the following year, though Mansfield's part was not used as the female lead, replaced instead with co-star Rosemary Hill. Of course, one reason for this was that the filming had not been completed before she died, though it had almost been finished. But it was probably more of a financial consideration. As a writer for the Los Angeles Times noted, Few, if any, posthumous pictures like those of Harold Lockwood or Olive Thomas have ever been favored. Unfortunately, Martha Mansfield is known more for her grisly death than for her movies. Her career was sadly very short, but just like Olive Thomas, she can still be briefly brought back to life with the small number of films from her career that have survived and are available. I hope you enjoyed the second updated video in this series, there's only one more to go now. I struggled to make the William Desmond Taylor segment relatively short and concise, so I hope it came out alright. I'm hoping I can make a deep dive video about the case sometime in the future. But I guess that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age.